Okay. So, let's do an exhaustive intelligent logical examination of telephotos. And there's nothing that gets people's panties in a wad more in debates and discussions on boards than uh, the best telephoto. And, uh, see, the problem is that uh, someone is looking at a gray card and they're saying it's mostly black, and someone's looking at the same card and they're saying it's, uh, you know, partly white. Yeah, the answer is that uh, both parties are correct, usually, when they're debating the best lenses. So what's the best lenses for the best applications? Cost, ergos, use, application. These actually are some of the best lenses. These are actually most of the best lenses of many, many, many that I've used. Um, and that's a lot. So, actually, I found uh, a neat way to uh, summarize it, and it kind of makes a neat little word. And it's scream. Speed, cost, rendition, or resolution. Ergos, very important when it comes to large telephotos. Uh, application, or use. And lastly, not so important, manufacturer, future compatibility. So, scream. Speed, cost, rendition, or resolution. Ergonomics, application and manufacture. Scream. S-C-R-E-A-M. So how does that apply to these lenses and exactly what you want to do, what you want to use them for? Let's take a look. And that way you can make an intelligent decision. Cost is a huge factor with a lot of people. Some people it's not an issue at all. Then the question becomes is you have all these idiots and different boards like diaper and pee review and all these boards talking about what's well, the best lens for... You know, we're not going to be talking about 400 millimeter you know, two eights here. We're not going to be talking about the uh, $10,000 plus class of lenses because uh, almost nobody asks me questions about that. And the people that do ask me questions about that already know the answers to me. They, they, they don't ask questions because they already know the answers. So in no particular order, we have to acknowledge the fact, and this is the case of all lenses, whether it's telephotos or otherwise, that every lens is a compromise. It always compromises one thing for something else. And then, and this is a hardcore fact, you better listen damn closely, you're going to have to decide what it is you're willing to compromise based on what it is that you want to shoot and or your budget and, uh, you know, your intended application for this lens. And, you know, maybe budget's number one concern. Maybe budget's not number one concern. If budget's not number one concern, you'll be buying most of these anyway. Or if a couple of them anyway, if you got no budget issues, which is not the case for most people, so... Then the question becomes, if you do have a budget, which is most people, then what it is you want to choose. Okay, let's be logical about this instead of, uh, you know, people, uh, you know, these knuckle-dragging simians, you know, fluent, flinging poo at each other's faces and uh, trying to debate over what's the best lens. Let's take the 70 to 300. Now, there are a lot of different Nikkor 70 to 300s. Nikons are making all kinds of 70 to 300. Okay, VRG. VRG, only this lens. Extremely fast autofocus. Okay. Obviously, it's not incredibly fast. It's a 4.5 to 5.6 lens. However, you can buy this lens used all day long for 300 bucks. I've not heard one piece in person that I recommend this to that was unhappy with this lens. It's just blazing fast, and for most situations, it's perfectly good enough. And God knows, for 300 bucks used, you know, it's an awesome lens. I've got a couple of them. Okay, let's take a look at another option. Now we have to decide too what we're going to be shooting. We're shooting birds. We're going to be shooting action. What exactly are you going to be shooting? What's its intended application? How important are ergonomics to you? How important is cost to you? How important is resolution to you? Let's take a look at another lens that tons of people have bought. You know, this lens, like every other lens here, has its positive and its negatives. What are the negatives of the 80-200 2.8D series autofocus? This lens still made $1,100. You can buy it all day long, which means like $500, $600, $650, depending on the condition. Incredibly well made. Slow autofocus. Well, how slow? Not that slow. How is it uh, compared to the Tamron 7200 2.8 and the zipping from one end to the other? It's about 35% slower. So, I mean, is that not so you can't take action shots with this? Yes, you can. What are the huge advantages of this lens over the Tamron, for example? Low element count relative to the Tamron, for certain. This has a lot of beautiful prime qualities. The rendition on this is exquisite. Uh, the resolution 
is only a hair worse than the Tamron, but it's an exquisite lens, it's cheap, it's well built, it's made like a tank. The other issue that this lens has, and even Nikon warns users of this, people complain about back focus, like what are you shooting at? And the answer is always the same, they're shooting it indoors and testing it, and something underneath about 20 feet. It's like, well, it's meant to focus at that range. Nikon warns not using this lens, you know, in, you know, it's not for indoor portraiture, let's put it that way. You're not going to stand back 15 feet and take portrait shots of this. You can. You have back focus issues. This lens is not meant for close quarters use. You know, it's perfectly perfect for weddings, wedding receptions, uh, most things. Um, is it fast enough uh, for horse races? Yeah, it certainly is. Is it be fast enough to capture motorcycles coming around the a blind turn? No, this wouldn't be the lens for that. So the one thing where this uh, is uh, deficient is in close quarters use, which Nikon warns you not to use it for that, and also an autofocus speed. However, the cost, you know, $600 for an exquisite copy from Japan and the United States, as opposed to the Tamron 70-200 2.8VC. This lens is, uh, I think, $1,150 uh, a new. Typically, you can find it for like $1,000 used and cheaper than that at the gray market. Blazing fast autofocus. Wham! Right there. Issues. This thing's got 23 glass elements in it. It has uh, color saturation issues. It's incredibly sharp. It's got rendition issues. You know, um, there's a lot of stuff you can tweak and post. Um, certainly, you can't add information that was never there to begin with on the raw file and the digital negative, but this lens is exquisite. It's blazing fast autofocus. It's a dream boat, and it has vibration control. 80 to 200, no vibration control. 7300 does have vibration control. What else? Well, you're not going to really find a used copy for underneath about $1,000, at least not one uh, that I would trust uh, buying from anybody. So this has its deficiencies and its pluses over the Tamron, and the Tamron has its deficiencies and pluses over the 70 to uh, 200 uh, Nikkor. Um, a faster lens at 300 mm is going to some of the longer focals, but before we get to that, here's another lens, not blazing fast autofocus. This is also a screw drive, like the D-series autofocus 80-200 to here. This is, this lens is just the tits, it's incredible, it's the 100, now all of these lenses, except for this baby right here, um, and this older AI lens, uh, are still made. This old D-series autofocus 180mm f2.8 built-in metal lens hood. Um, is exquisite, it's divine, it's sublime, outdoor portraiture, and to uh, utilize that uh, perfect lens compression, it's exquisite. It's just, it's the color saturation, the depth, and the beauty on this lens is exquisite. It's just unrivaled. It's, it's just awesome. 180mm f2.8, typically you can find these for like $350 used. Um, new, it's uh, skyrocketed and uh, new. It's still made. I think it's right at $1,050 uh, new. Um, but this lens is unmatched. But if you're going to use this for sports or action or something, you know, forget about it. It's not fast enough. It's plenty fast enough for a lot of stuff, but not fast enough for, you know, quite a few things also. So it's not meant for that. All of these lenses are exquisite and for what they're designed for, but there is no lens, it doesn't matter if it's something here you see or something you don't see here, they're never perfect across the board. Every lens, it doesn't exist yet. You know what would be the perfect lens in 80 to 200, 70 to 200? It would be this lens uh, that's able to focus really damn fast with uh, vibration control. If Nikon made this lens super fast, you're thinking, well, 7200 VR1 or VR2. No. Those are much faster autofocus than this, and they have vibration control. But those are not good lenses. They're not. They're insanely expensive at $2,400. They're, they're just not good. They're not worth the money at all. Don't recommend buying them. At any price, used or new, they're a horrible value. But if they had this lens, autofocus, vibration control, be very nice, but Nikon does not make that. And people think, well, sure they do in the VR1, the VR2, Nikkor 70, 200. No, it's not the same. Not the same output. Not the same output at all. Another perfect lens. Now we're getting a 300 millimeter focal. This is the 300 millimeter f/4 AFS silent wave motor internal. Um, is this blazing fast? Well, it's certainly a lot faster than a D series. Is it fast as the Tamron? 
No, it's not, but it's a 300 millimeter and it's a fast lens at f4. Well, f4 doesn't sound that fast. Well, for 300 millimeters, f4 is pretty fast. Um, no, used like new, uh, 700, low as 650, typically 700, 750 dollars. That's the AF. Bird photographers love the hell out of this lens. It's a beautiful prime, exquisite output, it's unmatched. Its value is extremely high, but it is an, uh, is a, a D series uh, Nikkor, but it has uh, internal silent wave drive motor for autofocus. It's it's just a wonderful lens. Um, its value is right at the top, right at the top. And I know what you're thinking about these, since these are two manual focus lenses, and a lot of people never consider these. And what they're thinking of is cheap Chinese junk uh, mirror lenses, which are crap. But this is a genuine Nikkor 500mm f8. It's like, oh, f8, that's not very fast. Oh, yeah, outdoors, it's plenty fast. It's manual focus, right? If you're not very good at manual focus, uh, especially on a, uh, an icon, that's an issue. However, this is perfect on a mirrorless camera. It's like, well, you may not on a mirrorless camera. you got focus peaking on there. This lens is 500, you know, this lens is 300 millimeters. You see this huge honker? This is 500 at f8. I could sit there and pack this thing around all day long. No weight consideration issues at all. I mean, 500 millimeters, you can really reach out there and yank it in. And the catadioptric bokeh on a mirror lens is absolutely beautiful. Some people hate it, but uh, it's exquisite. There have been like about a dozen... More than a dozen people actually buy this 500mm f8 mirror lens offered by recommendation. They are all insanely happy. Let me repeat that. They are insanely happy with this lens. Fixed aperture f8, you're not going to adjust the aperture. Everything's going to be, uh, you know, aperture, par <laughs> aperture priority or, uh, you know, manual. So you're certainly not going to take... Uh, um, you're not going to uh, be able to adjust the aperture on this little sucker. But uh, talking 200... $250, sometimes cheaper on this lens. 200 bucks for a 500 millimeter. Camera's going to pick the shutter on this one, of course, though. No big deal. Uh, this huge chunker. Uh, obviously, this is not an autofocus version, but if you want an autofocus version, 300 millimeter f2.8, it's going to run you a few thousand dollars. It depends on which version. I think there are seven different versions of autofocus, uh, 300mm f2.8 uh, from Nikon. This is uh, actually uh, the older uh, AIS uh, Nikkor 300mm f2.8, exquisite, with a monopod, you know, manually focusing th this thing is just as smooth as hot butter. Um, to get that beautiful portraiture with that beautiful lens compression and that shallow depth of field at 2.8, Taking outdoor portrait, you know, this is the thing that never enters in any photographer's mind. They're like, they're thinking, I'm going to take some outdoor portraiture in an open field, you know, I'm going to bring an 85 millimeter with me. It's like, well, you know, that's okay. You can get it down there. Shallow depth of field, nice bokeh. How about this? How about you take advantage of some really spectacular lens compression, get back, take some fascinating shots with the 300 millimeter f2.8. Why do you think you actually see professional photographers that can get closer to their subject if they want? You know, it's not like they're peeping toms, you know, snooping over somebody's uh, yard using this lens. It's, you know, a uh, consenting model or, uh, you know, consenting whatever, you know, that they can get closer to. That they step back and use this lens for. What do you think they're stepping back in using a 300mm f2.8 for portraiture? Beautiful effect. This lens is exquisite. Um, a very simple, robust, built like a tank, a low element count prime. Every one of these lenses is best at what it was designed for and best at what it is, uh, you know, intended to be used for. The question becomes a matter of debate, where people want to argue, well, this lens is better than this lens. No, 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 this lens is better than this lens. The answer is that all parties are correct. The question becomes, what do you want to do with it? What's your cost factor? What's your application factor? I dropped my little list here on the floor. Cost, application. Oh, like an idiot, I dropped it. Yeah, speed. Duh. Made my little list. Speed. Autofocus speed. Sorry, I'm a little tired. I've been busy all last night. Speed. Cost. 
autofocus speed. Ergonomics. What's your at intended application of use for this lens? Which one of these lenses? What's the priority in that? What's your priority on cost? What's your priority on application? What's your priority on resolution? What, what's your priority on rendition? Some people would rather have this because they love the super fast the autofocus speed and the vibration control. And some people would rather have this because this has much better color saturation, much better depth and rendition than the Tamron does. They can sacrifice uh, the autofocus speed and uh, you know the lack of uh, close focusing with this 80 to 200 2.8 D series in Nikkor. Also, the fact that that it's basically half as much as the Tamron 70 and 200 is, and additionally so half as much as this lens again. Uh, the uh, 70 to uh, 300 uh, VRG. This lens is blazing fast autofocus. Blazing fast. It's not that fast of a lens as far as its, uh, its light gathering capability over a given unit of time. 4, 5 to 5, 6. But it has vibration control. 80 to 200 does not. It's blazing fast. 80 to 200 is not blazing fast. It can focus relatively short distances. 80 to 200 cannot do that. And it's $300. This one used, the one you in really good shape used, about $600. So, you have to prioritize what is important to you on those list of criteria. So far as uh, resolution, application of use, autofocus speed, and cost. Prioritize those. Anyway, thanks for watching. If you like this video, drop it back or two. You know, you can tell me you jump off a cliff, whatever makes you happy. As long as I give you a well-informed, logical basis uh, to make a decision and informed conclusion upon, that's what's ultimately most important. Thanks. Okay, bye.